Hello and welcome to another week of the AFCB TV preview show. With two games coming up in a week, both myself and matchday commentator Chris Temple have plenty to get through today. Here's what's coming up. We'll be looking back at last weekend's stalemate here at Vitality Stadium as Southampton were the visitors. We'll also be looking ahead to tomorrow's game against Fulham at Craven Cottage. And finally, we'll turn our attention to Norwich City at home in the Carabao Cup on Tuesday. But before all of that, let's go back a week and look at the Southampton stalemate here at Vitality Stadium. Here are the short highlights. Smith coming dashing through the centre circle here. Great foraging run this from the fullback. Threads it through looking for the run of Wilson. Inside right channel. Adam Smith, he miscues it. Still maybe a chance. The back heel comes back to Lewis Cook. Driven across goal and cleared away by Southampton. Hoybier over the top looking for Austin and Ake let it bounce and Austin might be in behind here. The two defenders close the door, Austin goes round Begovic and then runs out of room and it runs behind for a goal kick. I thought about three times there whether it was going to be a penalty. The challenge never came in and... Right footed ball in the header from King. Flashes across the face of goal. Fast start, that's a good start to both halves, John Williams. That's a, that's a full on chance, Chris. First touch away from Cedric. Stanislas down the left hand side. Wilson with him. Also King. Now he plays Callum Wilson in. Can Wilson find the option? Pulls it back and missed by King at the near post. A sweeping move. Stanislas started it. Wilson's cross and King couldn't find the target. onto his left foot, crosses deep, thankfully too deep, and Francis to head it away. Only breaks as far as the shot from Hoybier. Back pedaling Begovic, palms it over the crossbar. Good effort from the Dane, corner. Well, there we go. There was nothing between the two sides here at Vitality Stadium last week. If you do want to watch the extended highlights, they're available for free on AFCB TV. Well, Chris, it wasn't quite the game we were hoping for, was it? It wasn't. Uh, as I said to the, the manager afterwards, I think 0-0 would have been the last score we'd have had written down for that game, given how Bournemouth had been scoring in Southampton. Defensively, had been pretty shaky. Uh, I mean, Saints came, for, came to not spoil the game, but came to be solid didn't they um I think pretty much they, they were delighted with a point um which is a testament to Bournemouth and the way that teams are now coming here to to set up a little bit more resolutely particularly the way Bournemouth have been playing so uh yeah it wasn't it it wasn't Bournemouth at their best um a combination of the way Southampton set up and also that one or two players were below their best I think they would admit that but uh, as I said to the manager afterwards and he, he maybe wasn't too happy with me suggesting that the bar now has been risen because of how they performed in the early stages of the season that you, you think oh you know a, a clean sheet everyone's disappointed with but the clean sheet was a positive it goes back to the Watford win where they won 4-0 kept a clean sheet but everyone thought it could have been more so that's how the bar was raised um, but on the face of it if you ask me, a home game against Southampton, who were where they were in the table, uh, that's a missed opportunity, not winning it. But at the same time, those games that you can't win when you're not at your best, get something from it. So, the, I mean, if Saints had nicked it here at the end, that would have been a travesty, if you ask me. Um, so it was fortunate those two chances went begging. And Adam Smith had a brilliant chance at the start of the game. If that goes in, it's a completely different game, isn't it? Yeah, and again, it comes with, is it too early in the game? And that was a fantastic run all the way you know, behind us here to the south end of the ground. And then just got his legs in a knot, didn't he, at the near post, just miskicked it. No one around him, five yards, five, six yards out. As you say, that's, that's a minute in. Uh, so that's the whole afternoon is different then because Southampton have to open up and uh, and the game changes. But those are 
those are the ones that you, you look back on. But the thing is, Bournemouth have been ruthless this season. I think they're second only behind, I think it's Arsenal or might be Manchester City in terms of converting the chances they've had. They're the second most ruthless team in the Premier League at the moment. So that was one, unfortunately, that, that did go begging. And you talked about the clean sheet, back-to-back -back clean sheets now. That was a real problem for the Cherries last year, but they seem to have sorted the defence out now. Yep, and as we reflected on previously, still no individual errors, which is good. Uh, and last week, they had to be, you know... <sighs> There'll be bigger attacking threats they'll face this season, but Charlie Austin and Danny Ings did give them a couple of moments. They they found a couple of channels. You know, Charlie Austin went through one on one and, and then ran out of pitch uh, in the first half. So you look at a couple of moments they gave them, and Danny Ings, you know, the form he's been in in the early part of the season. So they definitely knew they were in a game, but you know, Asmir Begovic he had to make the one save, didn't he, from Hoybier's uh, volley that he tipped over the bar. But apart from that, again, they largely kept them at arm's length. I would say it was a, you know, another confidence boosting clean sheet. Um, and I think it's fair to say if they can go to Fulham and keep a clean sheet, they will probably win. And you mentioned there were a couple of players that didn't quite reach the levels that we've seen, but was there anyone that stood out for you in the Cherry side? Uh, Jefferson Lerma, I think, again, we uh, got the sponsors man of the match. And I think you'd have to say in that sort of game, he did a really important job because he was breaking up a lot of the play. Bournemouth, you know, they weren't at their best with the ball. Uh, so without it, he was working hard. He was, he was doing what we've seen him do in the last two or three weeks, which has become that little bit of a spoiler that at times... They will need him to be. They don't need him to be that every week because when they've got the ball, he can link play and, and, and you know, get up and down and, and contribute to attacks. But there will be times when it's not quite flowing. They do need him to be the one who dip, gets his toe in and mixes it up a little bit. So I would say he was probably the, the standout performer again. And I think he is still getting better every week. So I'm really looking forward to seeing him against the big guns now. Because don't forget, Chelsea, I think, was his first Premier League game away. It's a bit much to ask him in that game to show his best in the big guns. But I'm fascinated to see how he comes up against, you know, Paul Pogba in a couple of weeks' time here against Manchester United. And of course, it wasn't quite the three points that we were after, but still a beaten at home. Still I'm beating at home and keeping this place a fortress is very important and it, it does leave the sort of equation that if you could get three points this weekend at Fulham, 20 points from 10 games, averaging two points a game, that's a, that's a great start. Um, so that's, that's the positive spin that, that I know the players were looking to put on it is that get something if you can't win, if you can't beat your best, get something uh, and it does leave the chance to, to go there and, and make it a nice round 20 after 10 on Saturday. Absolutely. Well, as Chris said, the Cherries are next in action tomorrow against Fulham. It was quite a good day out last time, so let's take a look at the highlights. Daniels. Big chance. Big goal. Brett Pittman. Closing in on a century of goals for the Cherries now. Across two spells with the club. And his ninth goal of this season gives his side a big stride in their push for a place in the Premier League. Mark Pugh. Martin. Ritchie. She fires one in, and a deflection helps it in. Bournemouth have scored two in seven minutes. And are looking much more like their old selves again. Ball worked first by Pugh, then by Arta. Marabietta trod on him. Pittman. Getting away from Parker, Brett Pittman! They really are an irresistible attacking unit when they find their stride. And that stride may be taking them all the way to the Premier League. First full goal. Not going to be any more. 
more than mere consolation. It's tapped for Ritchie to strike. And everything that Bournemouth is touching tonight is turning to goals. Emphatic, clinical, and unerring. Bournemouth. Away! Awkward for the goalkeeper, Steve Cook, Adam Smith, Cook once more, oh and Steve Cook has topped it off for Bournemouth. And Stanislas! And Pittman had a swing too. McCormack. Look how eager Bournemouth are to win the ball back. They're swarming. Stanislas has only been on the pitch for three minutes. Picked out by the right back, Francis. Return to form by Eddie Howe's Bournemouth. Well, there we go. Fond memories for a lot of Cherry fans there. And Chris, a 5 1 scoreline, could it be something similar tomorrow? Well, <laughs> there could be five goals in the game, that's for sure. I mean, Fulham have been shipping goals for fun. Just before we go on to that, a quick reflection of that game because for me, that was, and a lot of Cherries fans, that was the night I think that people realised Bournemouth were going up. Um, they hadn't had a great run actually coming into that game, but that was a little catalyst that propelled them towards the end of the season. Friday night games are few and far between, under the lights at Craven Cottage, it's a great place to go. Uh, the Steve Cook goal, I mean, and the Brett Pittman goal, everyone just talks about them now as uh, ma magnificent goals. And yeah, that was, uh, that was for me, that was the kickstart towards promotion. But going there this time around, Fulham, as I say, have been shipping goals left, right and centre. They play a great brand of football and you see shades of Bournemouth in them in coming into the division, possibly with a little bit of naivety and that we're going to play the same way. They scored a few, Fulham as well, but they have, I think they've conceded 12 in the last three games. Last home game, they lost 5-1 um, at home to Arsenal. So for those that like an omen, um, there's the 5-1-1 one, one for you. But I think they'll be learning as they go um, in terms of just having to take the edge off their attacking play or, or do something differently to become more, more, uh, more resolute in the back. Um, hopefully that's not this weekend. Hopefully they're still all over the place at the back this weekend. Uh, and the one thing I will say is, They've had a couple of tough games in terms of Arsenal and a couple of others, but you know to go to Cardiff and lose 4-2, and Cardiff can't score. So John Williams, my co-colleague, always jokes that, that the Cardiff nil is the, the new name of the club. So for Cardiff to score four, given the goal-scoring problems they've had against Fulham, they've got real defensive issues. So hopefully if the Bournemouth, if Bournemouth players are firing as we ha they have done, uh, there'll be a few more in that column, yeah. And it's worth mentioning that 10 out of the 14 players that played for the Cherries last time out at Craven Cottage are still a member of Eddie Howe's squad. That's quite something, isn't it? Quite testament to the job he's done. Absolutely. And we talk a lot about the consistency of the players that have been on the journey right since the start. And, you know, you think of, you know, even a couple that scored goals that night who are still playing their trade elsewhere. Matt Ritchie, you know, Bournemouth will come up against him in a couple of weeks' time at Newcastle. Brett Pittman obviously still doing it down the road at Portsmouth, scoring goals, albeit at a, a lower level. But, yeah, I mean, Steve Cook, told us that was the best goal he'd ever scored. Even last week, he said that was my best ever goal, that, that drill into the top corner. So, yeah, just testament again to the journey the club's been on and the building blocks that have been, you know, they were a few more blocks in that season that uh, ultimately leading to where we, where we stand here right now. And ahead of the game tomorrow, it was announced that Marcus Bettinelli signed a new contract for Fulham. Is that a boost for them ahead of the game? 
Well, it will be if he can stop the goals going in, <laughs> that's for sure. He's obviously highly rated. He's been on the fringes of the England squad. He got called in for training, didn't he, uh, in the, one of the last international breaks. So, uh, yeah, he's a very highly rated uh, young keeper. Uh, pretty sure Lewis Cook will know him from, uh, from England age groups uh, as well. But yeah, they, they haven't got a lot of a lot of Premier League experience in their team. They've they've largely gone defensively with the same players they had in the Championship, who are obviously finding it a whole new challenge in the Premier League. They've obviously got experience up front. The likes of Mitrovic and Schürrle obviously have been scoring their goals. Uh, one or two they brought in on loan. You know, Fossi Mensah, who was at, who was at Crystal Palace as well. Uh, Callum Chambers, who's an injury doubt as we as we speak right now from Arsenal, formerly of, of Saints down the road. So they are a little bit lacking in in top flight experience, and I think that is what has cost them so far. Um, is that they've got great players, but it is taking them time to adapt to the league. So defensively, I think they are definitely there to be got out this uh, this weekend, um, as long as we see Bournemouth firing like they were at Watford. And you mentioned Mitrovic and Schürrle there. Are they the two to look out for tomorrow? I think they have to be because they are two that know the league. Um, you know, Schürrle's obviously played at a great level, was at Chelsea uh, as well. And it's, it's an, I think it's a good club for him, Fulham, in terms of he obviously likes living in West London. It's obviously very nice around there. But yeah, they, they are the ones who have carried the goal threat for them so far. So uh, I think they are the two. And Mitrovic, again, is a, is a real bully of a centre-forward striker. So Cook and Ake, again, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, as they have done in the last couple of games against Deeney and against Charlie Austin, it will be a similar sort of test physically against, against Mitrovic. But the boys have, have shown they're up to it. And Eddie House just mentioned in his pre-match press conference that there aren't any fresh injury concerns. That's a massive boost, isn't it? Yeah, I spoke to Ryan Fraser uh, ahead of the weekend and he said he has been feeling his hamstring. It's not enough to keep him out, but he says he, he's been getting a few shooting pains uh, during the matches when he sprints. Uh, so he said it, sometimes it takes him two minutes to recover from that pain before he can sprint again. So uh, if you see him sort of not sprinting twice in the space of a minute, that's why. Uh, he's got a little bit of a hamstring, but not enough that will, would keep him out of the game. Um, Charlie Daniels still working his way back to full fitness, but he's got Tuesday night, of course, uh, as a chance to get some game time in. And Joshua King, no ill effects of his ankle problem uh, last weekend. So, yeah, at the minute, uh, often, as is the way when results are going well, the, uh, the little niggles seem to stay away. Well, tomorrow isn't the only game of the week for the Cherries as Norwich City come to Vitality Stadium on Tuesday night. Let's take a look at the highlights of the last round against Blackburn. Now Simon Francis trying to provide some assistance to Ibe on the right-hand side. If Ibe spots him, which he does now, Francis getting forward to get the cross in, pulls it back in towards Stanislas! That crowns a comeback to perfection for junior Stanislas. Six and a half months out, he looked to the heavens. We heard him talk about his faith before kick-off. It kept him going through the dark times. And junior Stanislas, under the lights, lights up the Vitality Stadium, 1-0. Jordan Ive, left side now, looking to get to the ball and away from his man. He's done well, Jordan Ive. He's gone down. He's won a penalty. Well, we're a long way away from it. Didn't seem to be a huge amount of contact as Jordan Ive got a little nudge. Up against the goalkeeper, Raya. Ive, no worries. Bottom right corner. Sent the keeper the wrong way. Justified his, I guess, uh, choice to take it. And he has put the Cherries two up. Oh, it's been lost by Lerma to Conway. And now there's a chance, Armstrong free. Conway shoots, Blackburn back in the game. Lerma lost it, Conway converted it. Bournemouth two, Blackburn one, 27 minutes to play. If Brereton can make something of this down the right-hand side, Rothwell goes on outside him, played in central field now for Conway, one more, it goes to Armstrong, Boric beats it away, Rothwell miscues, back into the centre, comes for Butterworth, the substitute, blocked away, Brereton in the six-yard box, great tackle by Mings, oh no, he's given a penalty! No, no, he's got that wrong, Mings has taken the ball, I'm pretty sure. Can Boric stand strong here for the Cherries? Keep their lead. It's hit off the post. It's 2-2. And job just about done for Adam Armstrong. Rupert, oh, give it a little voice. Oh, it's handball! 
Oh, dearie me, well, Williams is going to be sent off here. It's a red card because he slipped and Callum Wilson was going to go through one-on-one. -on -one. So Williams just picked the ball up. He just picked it up. Francis will still have time to put it back in. Wilson in there, over the goalkeeper, off the bar! Cleared away, still hasn't been cleared through, back across goal on the roof of the net from Simpson. Deflected past the goal, unbelievable drama right at the end, still time for a corner. Unbelievable amount of chances. The keeper's been magnificent for them. Keeper might even have got a touch on that one, I think, as Wilson's header came back off the bar. Corner left-hand side in front of the north stand, 2-2. In it comes, the header up, and it is a winner! for Blackburn, it's Bournemouth and Blackburn doing lead cut drama again, and it's Bournemouth progressing again, Wilson at the death, 3-2. Well, there we go, it wasn't easy for the Cherries last time out, but a 3-2 win that saw them progress in the Carabao Cup. And Chris, it's not going to be another easy game, is it? Norwich are flying. No, every round has got tougher. MK Dons, then Blackburn. I think Norwich is another another step again. Uh, they've been going really well in the championship. Really bright young team. Uh, again, home against a lower league team, as we've said every round when we've stood here and previewed the League Cup, is what you'd ask for. And now, of course, the competition's getting serious. A win this time on Tuesday puts you in the quarterfinals, where the Cherries were last season, of course, losing to Chelsea. So they certainly won't be um, taking Norwich lightly, as they haven't any other teams. And they'll know they've been in a game like they were against Blackburn where it all suddenly uh, was looking rosy and then went a bit Pete Tong. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good game. It's a big week um, because Manchester United are looming at the other end of it as well. But it is a great chance for some of the players who maybe haven't been featuring the likes of Charlie Daniels and Diego Rico and uh, Junior Stanislas, Jermaine Defoe, those sort of players to, to get themselves some game time. And I think those players will also start to become important in the league um, as well because... The manager was saying anybody who's been away on an international duty hasn't really had a break so far. The players who haven't been away, no problem with the physical side of the season, 10 games in. But for the internationals, they haven't really had a break. So uh, I reckon in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to see one or two get rotated. Uh, and that's where the sharpness from these League Cup games comes from. And as well as progressing in the competition, those players will know there may well be spots up for grabs in the next couple of weeks. So um, it's their opportunity to, to show it. But first and foremost, get into the quarterfinals. And as I said in the last, uh, the last time we previewed the League Cup, Bournemouth are going to win the Cup. They're going to win the League Cup. <laughs> and you mentioned there Manchester United coming at the end of the week. How important is that home game, not having to travel away in the middle of the week? Yeah, nice actually, very nice. I know that these days the players, they travel by plane and things, but in terms of the whole, you know, for the fans, it's great not to be going to Norwich on a Tuesday because that would be a, a beast of a journey, that is for sure, through the rush hour traffic. But yeah, I think it's nice. Um, Manchester United uh, obviously is, a, is an early kickoff as well, so uh, from that point of view. Um, but yeah, nice in terms of the home form more than anything, as well as you know, the logistics. Nice in terms of this is where the confidence has been. Uh, I know Watford was a great away performance, but I'd like to think Bournemouth would be would be big favourites to, to beat a lower division team here. Yeah. And of course, we're having a first at Vitality Stadium with VAR on Tuesday night. Yes, that's going to be interesting. I, I was at the World Cup when it was in action, and it is it is it's interesting the the suspense as the referee. You know, he's, he always seems to be miles away from the touchline whenever it goes to VAR. You know, he's he stood on the far side or something, and he has to run all the way over. A bit of drama as he puts his uh, head by the screen. So, and there's not a lot of room over there behind us by the uh, by the dugout. So, I'll be interested to see. You know, Jason Tindall, who likes to get involved in these sort of things with the fourth official and that ever, uh, whatever. They're going to have to keep him away somehow. They're going to have to have a little roped off area, I think, where they, they won't be able to go and interfere. So it'd be interesting to see how logistically that's laid out. But yeah, fascinating to see it involved. It's been tested here before in the Leicester game, but not in use. Um, so this time it's rigged up and fully in use. And I, I guess I don't want it to, to judge it against Bournemouth, but I'd quite like to see a VAR decision just for you know the, the novelty factor, really. Well, there we go. It's certainly going to be a very exciting game. That's all we've got time for today. If you are going to Fulham, have a safe journey. If not, we'll see you here on Tuesday night against Norwich. Thanks for joining us.